lives who once was dead, and because of that we also will live. Blessed are they who die in the Lord, they are with the Lord forever. Let us rejoice in the promises our Lord has made, and the promises he is certain to fulfill. We begin our worship this morning with 447. from the grave. 
We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We join in singing the first three stanzas of Christ the Lord is risen today. saw what was coming 
and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, saying that he was neither abandoned to the grave, nor did his flesh see decay. This Jesus is the one God has raised up. We are all witnesses of that. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join in reading responsibly today's psalm, Psalm 16. Guard me, O God, for I have taken refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The holy ones who are in the land are glorious. All my delight is in them. Those who chase after another god will increase their sorrows. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood. I will not take up their names on my lips. Lord, you are the cup that has been given to me. You have secured an allotment for me. The property lines chosen for me fall in pleasant places. Yes, a delightful inheritance is mine. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. Even my flesh will dwell securely. Because you will not abandon my life to the grave. You will not let your favored one see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. Fullness of joy in your presence. Pleasures at your right hand forever. The next reading from God's word is recorded by the Apostle Peter. These words will serve as the basis of the sermon today. We read from Peter's first letter, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy he gave us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance that is undying, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Through faith you are being protected by God's power for the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the end of time. Because of this, you rejoice very much, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various kinds of trials, so that the proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, which passes away even though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Through Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, yet by believing in him, you are filled with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Says the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for today's reading of the gospel. The Gospel account that is usually chosen for this the second Sunday of Easter is the account of Jesus appearing to doubting Thomas. We read from John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But Thomas, one of the twelve, the one called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, 
and put my finger into the mark with the nails, and put my hand into his side. I will never believe. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated for him, 456.
Grace and peace and joy, inexpressible joy, be yours in the knowledge that you've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient and be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God's word for our encouragement today is from the Apostle Peter's first letter to Christians who are scattered throughout modern-day Turkey who are facing great persecution. The saying goes, what you see is what you get. Now, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. If you're looking at a used car and it's got a lot of rust, and they say, what you see is what you get, most likely means the engine's not going to be that good either. You're going to get just like it appears. Not a Cadillac, nothing great. On the other hand, maybe they're selling a fine looking vehicle and by saying what you see is what you'll get means you're going to be pretty pleased with this vehicle. The outward appearance is the same as the inward appearance. Although sometimes what we see can be deceiving, the outward appearance may look pretty good, but on the inside, we're not getting that. Or it may be the other way around. On the outside appearance, it looks pretty bad, but we may be very pleased to find that in the inside, it's really good and very useful. So the saying, what you see is what you get, isn't always true. And today we're supposed to look at, as Peter encourages us and the Christians scattered throughout the world, we're supposed to look at something we cannot see. Well, how do we know then what we're going to get? Our Lord Jesus is risen from the dead. We do not see him. But by the power of the Holy Spirit and through his word, we do see him. And seeing him, we have these certainties. God's word for today reminds us. We have the assurance we're going to be with the Lord forever in heaven. And this side of heaven, the Lord through his word is going to be with us and strengthen us as we go through this, the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus led his apostle Peter to write these words to a group of people that are going through a lot of hardships, they're going through a lot of persecution. Maybe inwardly they're complaining, we didn't sign up for this when we became Christians. We didn't expect to be suffering more problems. We didn't expect to be persecuted, to have the Emperor Nero putting many Christians to death. Is it really worth it? The Apostle Peter encourages his fellow disciples, his fellow Christians who are new in the faith. He reminds them of something he was blessed to see with his own eyes. He saw in that upper room locked, and he saw on other occasions as well, he saw the resurrected Lord. When Jesus died, Peter was probably thinking like everybody else, all is lost. We followed this man, Jesus, we thought he was the Christ, but it turns out he wasn't, because he died. But seeing him raised on the third day, as Jesus said would happen, to strengthen Peter in his faith, made him to understand, oh yes, the scriptures needed to be fulfilled. And they have been fulfilled. The scriptures, Psalm 53, talks about the Christ being like a servant who will be stricken, smitten, and afflicted. He will be hung on a cross. He will be buried in a rich man's tomb. But those words, those prophecies, don't end with that. 
At the end of that chapter, it says that the servant, the Christ, will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by coming back to life, he, as a conqueror, is going to give the spoils, the blessings of his resurrection, to those who believe in him. Because Jesus is risen, his disciples, his followers, will rise too to eternal life. As Isaiah says, the Lord will prosper his will in his hand. So even though the disciples, the Christians scattered throughout the world were going through their hardships, Peter urged them to see the God that they cannot see and to worship him. He says at the beginning of our text, blessed, or may he be praised, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why should we praise him when life is so tough? Because he gave us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, what is this new birth? What is this living hope? It's an inheritance that's promised to you who believe. An inheritance that is undying, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. It's the same inheritance that King David was looking forward to, and he said in Psalm 16 that the boundaries of my inheritance, my allotment that you've got prepared for me, they've fallen in great places, beautiful places. Which that makes us think as nice as our lot in life here may be, that we have a nice home and nice land on which to, to farm or to switch to hunt or snowmobile or whatever. Think of what heaven will be like. Eternal pleasures at God's right hand. David looked forward to it. Job looked forward to it, trusting that I know my Redeemer lives yet in my flesh. I will see the Lord with my own eyes. I will see him. Peter reminds these Christians, see what you don't see with your earthly eyes. See because of God's word. Heaven is open and there's a place prepared for you. A place where there's not going to be any sorrow, no pain, no disease. No need for contacts or hearing aids or crutches or walkers. And as I visited with one of our members this week in the nursing home, her reaction was to this, these words, Wow. Yeah. Inexpressible joy that will be that all the pains, the consequences of sin and sin itself gone. And we're with the Lord forever. Certainly these were encouraging words for the Christians that were suffering throughout the world. Peter reminding that because Jesus has risen, we get the spoils of his victory. We get heaven. We get forgiveness. We get the promise God's going to be with us. Hear our prayers. Work everything out for the good. He lives. He lives indeed, he who once was dead. May God help us to see what Peter saw, to see what the Christians in the past have seen through faith. Our Lord Jesus lives, and he lives to prepare a place for us in heaven. Jesus promises you, and he is not one to fail on his word, I will bring you to be with me, that you may be where I am. Rejoice that Jesus' resurrection assures you of an eternal inheritance. Because of this, Peter said, you rejoice very much. And we rejoice today to know, blessed are those that have died in the Lord, and blessed are we whenever we will die. But until that day comes, Peter reminds us that life won't be a rose garden, a rose garden without thorns. Peter says, for a little while, 
you, my fellow brothers, have been grieved by various kinds of trials. Hardships, illnesses, the death of family members and friends. This is a veil of tears. And during all of these times, while you're suffering persecution, you may be led to lash out at God and blame God and complain about God's will that it's not good and it's not right. <clears throat> well, you may ask, why is this happening? Peter, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reminds us that even in the bad things, God is going to accomplish his good. He says, these things have happened to you so that the proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, which passes away even though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter, by inspiration, Holy Spirit understood that the hardships that are happening to us, they're not pleasant, but God is going to use these things lead us to trust in him more. Certainly to turn to him where before we might not have turned to him. But the Lord, who has begun that work of faith in these people's hearts, he is faithful and will bring it to completion. He will keep them blameless till the end. So too we may be tempted when things are bad to blame God and complain to God that he is not fair. But think about all the things we have in our life, our homes, our clothing, our money, our car. All these things are only temporary. In a moment's notice, a tornado can completely destroy a home. Our car will rust and fall apart. Our money is not guaranteed to us. That too can disappear or can become worthless. Even our own bodies, as healthy as, and strong as they once were, they're not forever. As the psalmist wrote, our years are 70 or 80 years if God gives us the strength. Everything is temporary. But what the Lord has prepared for us, that is eternal. And that's why faith is such an important blessing that God not only gives but that he protects and strengthens. And God in his wisdom, and we have to confess, his ways are not our ways, but his ways are higher and better than our ways. And he, because he loves us, who brought us into this world, he certainly, according to his time, will take us to be with him in heaven. God is good. His mercy endures forever. Our faith is so important. And we see our human weakness when it comes to faith. We say, I'll believe in you, Lord, if you'll do this for me. Or we may stray from God's word and God's house for a time in our life because we feel we're invincible. Then problems come. And the first temptation is blame God. He's not fair. But we go to God's word and we're reminded, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm with you always. I work everything out for the good. So the Lord draws us back to hearing his voice, realizing how important it is to hear the word of God. Reminding us all, doubting Thomases, how much we need the Lord and how great of a victory it is so that we, like Thomas, in the end say, you are my Lord, you are my God. When I look around and see things out of control, I can still see, Lord, you are God. May God help us to look beyond what our earthly eyes can see and to see him who we can't see with our eyes. The apostle wrote to these Christians, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, Yet by believing in him, you are filled with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 
It's not what you see that you get. It's what God promises. That which you cannot see, but you see by faith, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a God who is with you always and will watch over you. You're going to get a God that's going to give you your daily bread and take care of you. You're going to get a God who sends his angels to watch over you in all of your ways. You're going to get a God that's going to say on your last day, Come and receive the inheritance, the eternal inheritance I prepared for you before the creation of the world. Rejoice in the grace of our God. See what the scriptures say is true. And blessed are you who have not seen, but yet believe. May God strengthen us in our faith that we see heaven is our home and the trials in life the Lord will use for our good. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat> the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will continue to guard you and keep you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue with our confession of faith. We use the words of the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. At this time in our worship service, we will welcome Mr. Brandon Burke as a member of our church. Please come forward. <coughs> members of St. Peter's Lutheran Church. Brandon, having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, desires to be a member of our congregation. Your brother in Christ, our Lord Jesus promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him here on earth. You have come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's word and sacraments, and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, answer, I will, and I, will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard
heard your promises, we, the members of St. Peter's Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love and invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you have joined Brandon to your church when he was born again of water and the Spirit in baptism. In mercy you taught him your saving truth. Grant that he may offer himself as a living sacrifice to you as his spiritual act of worship. Transform him by the renewing of his mind so that he will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and welcome. We continue with the prayer of the church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, through your word you have given us peace and hope. Through your Son's resurrection from the dead you have assured us that we are no longer in our sins and that our faith in you is not in vain. You have made us to be confident of the fact that we ourselves will be raised to life and our bodies will be transformed to become like Christ's glorious body. We pray, O Lord, keep us in this saving faith and remove all doubts and fears from our hearts and minds. O risen Lord, we praise your glorious name for completing the work your Father sent you to do. As you yourself said would happen, you suffered and died for our sins and then rose on the third day for our justification. Help us now to boldly and joyfully proclaim what you have done to save all people. Empower us with your spirit that we may speak your word faithfully and boldly even in the face of persecution. O Holy Spirit, we thank you for the peace you have given us and continue to give, up, give us through your word and sacraments. You've shown us that in Christ we are now heirs of heaven and are free to serve you to bear fruits of faith which are pleasing in your sight. Fill our hearts with a constant longing to hear and read your word and to receive your holy supper so that we may continue to grow in the knowledge of you and your grace. Strengthen us in our faith that we may ever confess you as our Lord and God and may lead others as well to worship you. O Triumph God, we pray on behalf of those who are ill you cannot be with us to worship today. Reassure them through your word and through our words of encouragement that you will be with them and work everything out for the good. Strengthen our brother in Christ, Glenn Parolfi, as he recovers from knee surgery. Be with our sister in Christ, Sarah Hines, as she will have an MRI tomorrow to see why her knee is failing her. We pray also be with Glenn and Diane Lidke's daughter, Lisa, as her health continues to worsen because of her cancer. Be with Lisa and reassure her and her family that you are her God, who lives and reigns and makes all of their cups to overflow with the never-failing and never-ending blessings of your love, mercy, and grace. We also pray for our brother in Christ, Norm Snortheim, as he and his brothers, Harold and Robert, will be flying to Washington, D.C. tomorrow with the Veterans National Honor Flight. Grant these veterans safe travels, good weather, and a blessed time together with one another. Especially lead them to thank and praise you for protecting them from harm in battle and for blessing them and our nation so much throughout their lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen. Now our thank offering will be brought before the Lord. <clears throat> we thank you, gracious God, for all the blessings in life you 
give us. We take these blessings for granted many times, so we pray, Lord, lead us to worship you always with a thankful heart. And lead us to trust in you to work everything out for the good as you promise. Use these thank offerings to further the spread of the gospel, both here at St. Peter's and throughout our synod and throughout the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise. If we continue now with the order of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts.
through faith until life everlasting. His peace be with you. Your sins and Jesus are forgiven. Amen. The first communion hymn will be sung with the help of the Hymnsoft program. Please note that after the third stanza, there's this awkward pause. That's because in the previous hymnal, there was five verses, and now there's eight. So our first hymn will be sung with Hymnsoft.
Please rise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our clothing hymn in 510. <laughs>
Uh, following church here briefly, we'll have the Kids Connection video. We'll show that. Um, the Daughters of Christ social will take place at Trinity today at 1.30, starting then, going until about 4 o'clock. And there's a district uh, mental health meeting that's intended for the lay leaders of congregations together with their call workers to attend. And I believe there's a, a group of uh, elders together with myself that will be going to that meeting today at 3 to 5. If any other leaders in the church want to accompany, they can. Um, this week, Bible study catechism happens as usual. Next Sunday, we will have our voters meeting. We encourage all voters and all, all members of our church to attend and listen in at the work that is being done here at St. Peter's. Um, certainly you can see, your eyes are not deceiving you, it's Easter, you see the Easter lilies, and thank you so much that for those, to those that have donated these beautiful flowers, to the glory of God, and for the beautifying of our, of our worship, uh, you can take them home today, I don't know how much longer they will last, really right now they're looking very good, but take them home and enjoy them if you ordered them, and thank you once again for that. I believe that is all. Sign up for meditations if you are interested in receiving that. And, and thank you. Lord bless you and keep you. I will try to get the Kids Connection video going here in a second. And it's Kids Connection. instrument is singing by itself and it's cool to see how 
if you have a congregation singing with you, that you're part of that leader and helping um, send the praises to God. We all know how to sing. How do you get music from a string instrument? Let's hear from orchestra director, Kaylin Lawson. She spends her days teaching kids how to make music. I have in front of me a cello. Um, I have my bow here. So basically to play, what we're gonna do is bring our bow across the strings. Uh, we press down with our left hand on the notes. You can play open strings if you just know. Right, with your open strings, and then you add your hand and then press down to get your notes you can do. Right, something like that. And you can press down. Um, you can go higher or lower, right? You can go kind of. Some of my grade school students' favorite things to do in lesson is to go on your highest string and kind of emulate an ambulance. So you can just, and it's a great way also to uh, have your left and right hands work together. So you just kind of don't stop with your bow, don't stop with this hand, and you just go. And it kind of is more effective using a violin, because violin can go a little bit higher than the cello can, but it's one of their favorite things to do. Music challenges your body and mind differently than anything else. As you learn the basics, you can get better and better. You can even play in church and help others sing praises to Jesus. Having the opportunity to use my gifts, everyone has separate gifts and everybody's good at their own thing, but using my gifts to be able to worship God in, in my own way, in my own unique way is amazing. If you want to learn how to play an instrument, start with your parents or your teachers. Talk to people at your local church. There are a lot of musicians and churches. We're very blessed to have churches filled with musicians that can teach, and piano is a great way to just start with note reading, just kind of starting to understand music, the concepts of music, music theory, and all that fun stuff. It's so special when you have a gift like the music that's given by God to be able to use it to glorify Him. Now it's time for Pastor Tony Schultz. God's word says, blessed is the person who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water. It brings forth its fruit in season. Its leaf doesn't wither, and whatever it does prospers. April 2nd is Palm Sunday. We wave our palms and say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Monday, Thursday, Jesus celebrates Passover one last time with his disciples. He told them, A new commandment I give you, love one another. And he say, That's the oldest commandment in the world, to love God and to love your neighbor. But Jesus said, as I have loved you, that's how you love one another. And Jesus got down on his hands and knees, and he washed his disciples' filthy feet. He established Holy Communion, his body and blood given for us. Then he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed with such passion and such urgency that it hurt, you can't imagine. Beaten, condemned, Crucified, Jesus died for my sins and all your mistakes. Easter morning, Jesus is alive again, and because he lives, we too shall live. We are like trees planted by the river. God's word gives us refreshment and waters us. We bear fruit of faith, sweet and juicy and delicious. And when people around us notice 
Why do you do what you do? Why do you act that way? Why are you so eager to love and to give and to serve? And we tell them, because Jesus is in my heart. The Easter gospel colors what I say and what I do. All glory to Jesus and him alone, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Schultz. Thank God for the gift of music and the amazing talents of people who play music. See you in May. Until then, remember, stay connected to Jesus.